Hey there, this is Pat Ennis of Ennis Legacy Partners. Welcome to the Exit Readiness Podcast. I'm here with my co-host, Walter Dial, CPA and tax partner, GRF, CPAs and Advisors in Bethesda, Maryland. Our mission here on the podcast is to provide you, the business owner, with subject matter expertise on topics pertaining to building transferable or sellable business value, and then for planning uh, your eventual exit from the business. We want to help you build a business that is transferable and then exit successfully on your own terms and conditions. Uh, in our last episode with Sam Clydman, we talked about how to effectively make decisions regarding what products and services uh, a business uh, and, and offers. And uh, Walter, another challenge <clears throat> for our business owner clients, continual challenge when it comes to sales and marketing of their products is, is creating and executing on a marketing plan. Uh, when digital marketing options seem endless these days and ever changing, it can be tough to know what to do and then have confidence, well, in what to do and then how to measure ROI. What do you think? What What are your thoughts? Yeah, I, I would agree with that. I mean, I think, you know, for a lot of our business owners, marketing is kind of one of their least well understood activities, especially in this digital age with all these new options out there and opportunities that they hear about. Um, and I just think, you know, a lot of businesses don't, they don't really make it a top priority. They got so many, so many other things going on. So while they may start to do this or that, you know, the word, like you use the word plan, I would also use the word strategy. That just doesn't seem to exist for most of our clients when it comes to marketing. Yeah, and so that's what we're going to talk about today, uh, uh, creating a plan that's indeed ex executable and one that you can have confidence in. And, um, and uh, so our guest is Tobin Lehman. He's the founder and owner of New North. Tobin's an author and founder of uh, New North, an, an, an award-winning digital marketing agency dedicated to helping B2B tech firms grow. He has over two decades of working with brands like Southern States, Pfizer, Thermo Fisher, Fisher Scientific, Kimberly Clark, and a host of others, and has earned an industry reputation for taking the mystery out of marketing with clear strategies and real results. He has a bachelor's in graphic design and photography from Penn State. Uh, he's previously taught uh, design and business courses as an adjunct professor at American U and Shepherd University. He served as the local president of American Advertising Federation. And he's on the board of the local AIGA and other nonprofit boards. Tobin, uh, Tobin, welcome to the podcast. Good to be here, Pat and Walter. Excited to talk today about some marketing. Yeah, it's good to have you. Hey, Tobin, you must have been a late bloomer. You, know, you went to Penn State, so you must not have really gotten smart until after after college, I guess. Huh? <laughs> well, I don't know if we want to have that conversation on the uh, on the podcast, but um, yeah, no, it was, it was a fantastic uh, education, actually. But you know, what was interesting, you know, was um, the realization kind of coming out of schools, so like Pat mentioned, I have a degree in design. You know, I was more graphic uh, oriented, visual, um, but I also actually have a minor in sociology as well. Um, I was fascinated by how people think and kind of how structures organize and things like that. This was actually, um, you know, kind of, I, I saw the connection, but not everyone, everyone did in that case. So when I got into the actual real world, um, I realized that decisions are made in strange ways for businesses. Um, you think everything is really logical, numbers driven, not necessarily true, um, especially with CEOs and owners. And so, um, really, this idea of trying to understand decision-making processes um, and how people organize and think um, with just how effective advertising works in, in cases, just that collision. And, and luckily, I was, um, you know, I got out of schools early 2000s when kind of post-bubble uh, for the internet, but the, the, the real digital revolution started to happen in a bigger way. I mean, I started in this career before Facebook, before Google Ads, before analytics. So... You know, I was kind of, you know, providentially blessed to be on the front side of all of this stuff. And I've just been able to ride the wave. So um, there's you know, many in my generation now that are really just part of that process. And, um, you know, that's kind of a lot of the premise of, of the book I wrote too, but just being able to 
understand what's going on is like the hardest part for a lot of businesses because it just constantly changes. It's always evolving, it's moving. And so the, you know, so the book and probably what we'll talk about here today is just how to make sense of it all as change just keeps coming. Yeah, so you know, most of the clients that Pat and I work with are not your age, they're more like our age. And as I was shocked to hear Pat say the other day, we're actually in our early 60s. Unbelievable. So yeah, that's that's like the new that's like the new early 40s. Okay. Yeah. That makes me feel a little yeah. better. So Toby, what do you say to somebody our age when we just we look at this and say, you know, how am I supposed to what are my first steps in trying to get a grasp on all this digital technology when it comes to marketing out there? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. Um you know, and you know, obviously I've I've gotten various family members and, you know, various experience. We have clients, you know, that are your age and, you know, I'm, I'm 42. And so I don't really think 60, 65 is that old anymore. Um, probably would have sounded that, that way, but I see how fast life moves. Um, <laughs> but I think part of it is to not, not be discouraged, right? Like there's a, there's a, there's a challenge. I mean, I'm a digital native. I grew up on a computer. Right. I mean, I was absolutely on a computer all the time. And my first computer I had when I was 10, um, you know, a little Tandy. So I'm, they call it a digital native, like the cell phone was in my world and all these kind of things. So outside of that, you know, there's a lot of hype, a lot of noise. And so the, the key for anyone, you know, whether you're 60 or 40 or 30, really is to, is to start cutting through that noise. Right. Like we, we meet so many people who make decisions on like marketing tech based on somebody else's recommendation, purely alone. Like, hey, you're out golfing or something and you said, hey, we're doing great on Facebook. Oh, we're gonna go do that. Yeah. That, is, that is like the worst decision, right? You can make in that case, because you're basically saying, well, this business is doing something and it's working for them, we should try it too. There's so many factors that go into that, right? So there's so many things that, that go into it. So I would recommend really this idea of just as you would evaluate anything, like finding some kind of understanding of what you can do with this and, and you know, getting involved as you can, like this may seem like a, a, a dirty secret, but like, I don't, like I'm not really following things like Clubhouse right now, personally. I think it's not really targeted towards our customer, but like I'm just picking and choosing what I want to get involved with. And I think anyone in the, in the business owner sense or in, you know, thinking about marketing plan needs to be open, but also needs to be discerning what they want to get into, right? There's certain things that work. There's certain things that are a little more experimental. Um, but as a, as a, you know, in maybe you know more mature business owner, the, the overwhelming nature, all the choices, the first scenario is just to narrow it down. Right. There's tried and true stuff. And, you know, an advisor like me, just like how you guys help advise business owners to focus on the essentials. Right. Because there's so many things you can do um, just to focus on the essential pieces and getting those working for your marketing. Um, because if it's new and it's buzzing, like. You can let it go for a while. <laughs> like You can just let, yeah. let it settle. Right. Like the reality is like most businesses don't need to be on TikTok right now or experiment with Clubhouse. Now, if you've got momentum and marketing people and stuff, sure, you can go do that. But if you're, you know, 30 year old business and you've been living mostly on referrals, like you can ignore most of that right now until you're really to get aggressive into marketing. And there's a, there's a process for that. So I think it's just to take a deep breath, right? It's like, take a deep breath. There's, there's always going to be new stuff coming out, but focusing then on what the core things are like in this day and age, like obviously you need a website. Obviously there's ways you can drive traffic to that website through cost and pay-per-click and, and things like that. So just really trying to understand from, from an advisor or someone on your team, what we think the essentials are we need to start with. And that's the basis then of your, your marketing plan. Yeah. So, Hey Tobin. So then, okay. Mm -hmm. That, that all makes great sense. Mm -hmm. I think though, the, the owners that we deal with, it, we talk to them a whole lot about essentials and all kinds of different mm -hmm. categories. When it comes to, to creating a marketing plan, the way we're talking about it here, particularly with the digital stuff, they don't know, they don't have confidence as to what the essentials are or what the core things should be. But from your perspective, what are, does do the essentials for one business 
uh, change for um, uh, for another business, or is there a common set of essentials? You know, how would you answer that question? Well, I answer it two two ways. It's a good, really good question, Pat. Um, one, I'm openly biased because I'm a digital marketer. Okay, so just everyone take it, take that, you know, uh, to the bank here. Like, so I'm, I'm going to talk about digital things. In that sense, the second option is, you know, everyone needs to have a website, right? That's just a, I mean, that's going to be an essential. Anything we're going to do in the digital marketing world is going to come back to the website. Um, there's going to need to be a link to a site. So everyone's going to have a website. That's just almost a de facto kind of thing. I've, I've met and actually worked with businesses who are, you know, 20, 30 years old, no website, doing, you know, seven figures, eight figures. And you kind of scratch your head, like, how is that possible? Well, it's referral business, right? It's a different, different nature, but they're, you know, they're talking to me because they want to eventually get a website here and, and get it going. So it's not strange, but I would say it's essential that you would have a website at this, this day and age. But, but then you're absolutely right. Like, how do you determine what are the other elements you need to do? And so it's, it's in a sense, part of the process that we talk about in Ride the Tornado. So I'll just kind of Plug, plug the book a little bit here. So I wrote this book, Ride the Tornado. It's about making decisions in rapid change. Um, I actually wrote it pre-pandemic, not really understanding what was about to happen in 2020, but this is the process we use to kind of answer that problem is how do you kind of navigate all the different choices, all the different pieces that are out there? The, the reality is there, there is a way, and this is what I mentioned, like I've you know, been doing this for 20 plus years now. This stuff's been flying in our face for 20 years We've had to develop a process to discern what to use and what not to use because there's just so many choices, right? There's things just coming down the assembly line in the news, this social media channel, this technology, this technology, et cetera. So answer the question, like, how do you make that decision? Well, you, you make it in what we call the, the framework, the RTX framework, which is basically a framework that helps you just think through how to process these things. Um, so it's a simple process. Assess, ideate, execute. It's a cyclical kind of process. Um, you know, the, the answer here is like assessing, which is looking at data, which is really the driver of all of this. Ideating, which is coming up with ideas and basing off that data. And then execution, you try some things. And this can be done on a monthly basis, typically how we do it as an agency for our clients. But you have to understand what you're trying to accomplish. The center of this circle is your goal, right? And so um, the... The, there's a graphic in the book and you can see it on the, on the website too, but the answer is what's your goal, right? The first, or the first question, sorry, is what's your goal? So if you are trying to develop leads from your website, if that's your business model, um, if you're, your B2B, that's, that's where we typically play is B2B space, B2C space for sure. You're, you're definitely trying to get business from your website. Some B2Bs, if they're like federal contractors or things like that, don't use website quite as essentially for lead generation. Um, but um, if you're typical B2B, you, you would have as your goal. So the goal is what matters the most. So what is your goal? If you don't have a goal to get business from website, it definitely changes how much investment you make into your website. But you may have a different goal, like hiring. That influences then what you do. So if you know your goal, if your goal, and we'll assume for the point of this conversation, your goal is to grow your business through your website, then you start that process. Well, what is working on the website? Let's look at the data. Let's assess the data. How much traffic are we getting? How much of this we're getting? And then if you're getting nothing, we can say maybe the case, then you start ideation. Well, let's start trying some things, right? With the rapid choice of what's going on and all the different things we can do, we can try things. We can try things like Google Ads. We can try a Yelp listing. We can try our Google My Business. We can ideate and try these things, try them for a period of time. And then we come back, we execute, and we come back and we assess how the results were. Like, do we get the traffic we wanted? Do we get these things? So you assume or you kind of determine those essentials through a process of assessing, ideating, and executing and making that loop happen over time. And eventually you discover what your essentials are. And in the book, you know, at the beginning, you, you may just, everything's kind of a, an experiment. Um, but we, we kind of advocate once you get a little bit more mature in that process that about 20% of your budget is purely experimental. So if maybe you're a little bit further down the road, you have a website, you're trying some things, maybe you have an email newsletter. Well, then think about 20% of your budget to be just trying new things. Like try the next social media channel, try this, but you're trying it in a context of what do we hope to have from it? Like what do we want to get from it? We're going to ideate, we're going to think about some ideas, how we do it, we're going to execute it, and we're going to see what happens. 
And if it doesn't hit the metric we're trying to get or establish the traffic we want or work for our business, we can get rid of it, right? That's the, the beauty of it. And so I, I consult lots of businesses and we'll come in and we'll assess what's going on with their, all their different channels. And, you know, I have the, the joy of saying like, you should get off this, this, and you should drop Twitter and you should do this because you're not getting anything from it, right? You just, if you have a framework for understanding what you're doing and assessing what you're doing, then it's easy to make decisions. And that's kind of the, the premise of the book. And really what I advocate for a lot of business owners is the, the, the true knowledge starts on how effective you know what you're doing is, is working, right? If you don't know, then you have to start trying and getting out there. But eventually you'll get an idea of what works and what doesn't work. And then you can execute and you can try and you can build those pieces up. And that's how you eventually get to what those essentials are. There isn't, I don't like pushing out there and saying like, these are the essentials. I mean, website for sure, but and everyone can benefit from something like pay-per-click to the most part, but without really understanding what your goal is, you don't, you don't have a set sense, but I don't think there's a mandatory level of social media. I don't think there's a mandatory level of email. Both are really good tools. You can use them, but to assess and to grow into them, you need to understand what your goal is, right? So if you're going to grow client base, then that should inform how you approach email. Obviously that would mean you might want to drive traffic. So you do some paid ads, things like that, but that, that kind of get, a little closer to the answer to that question. Yeah, it does. And and so in reading your book, Ride to Tornado, and um, main premise being because of uh, the constant change and in, in, in new developments in this whole space, particularly digital marketing, you are proposing that a long-term plan for marketing, and this made perfect sense to me, is no longer viable, that it needs to be... Yeah. Um, uh, it, it, more short term and, and a process like you put forth in Ride the Tornado needs to be continual. Uh, assess, ideation, execution, that's section two of your book. Yep. So, you know, if you're a small business owner, most of the owners that, uh, that Walter and I work with, they're 50 million and less in revenue, and most of them are probably 15 million less in revenue. And so when when you talk, start to talk about something that's constantly changing and something that I constantly have to be on top of, and I can't put a long-term plan in place and just monitor it long-term, I got to constantly assess and ideate and, and all like that, and, and in an area that they're not real confident in to begin with. Mm -hmm. it, it, you know, the premise, which is, I think, right, uh, can be, it can just cause angst and, and anxiety yeah. about, okay, I don't understand this to begin with. It's not something I'm real confident in, but it's something that I got to continually stay on top of and, and reassess and re-ideate and re-execute. Yeah. Um, it, it, what would your response to that be? Yeah, I, I feel you. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's, that's what, you know, the, the, the life that we live constantly you know, in the agency world. But as a CEO, I can, I can empathize, right? Like you want to create systems, you want to create these kind of um, manageable processes, right? And, and so on the, on the one sense, you know, backing up to why, why I believe this to be true, why it's incessant, the whole, you know, front section of the book talks about this, just the spirit of how much things are changing. Um, if I don't, I don't need much more case study than 2020 to say an annual plan for 2020 would have been a waste of time, right? Everyone can nod their head and be like, yeah, we can see that. I mean, that's, that's an extreme Tobin. Like that's a weird, you know, it, you know, once in a lifetime international pandemic. Well, the reality is that's just a, a hyperbole of what just happens normally, right? I mean, new systems come out, new things change. And so to think you're going to mark out a detailed 12 month plan I think is a lot of burnt calories that are not never going to see the light of day just because we've done it. We've done that for, for years prior to adapting a system like this, where you sign 12 month contracts, it's got all the details of all the tactics we're going to do. And sure enough, three months, six months in, take your pick. It changes. There's change orders, there's tweaks, there's changes, the market shifts, uh, new competitors, consolidation. I mean, business changes so quickly. We, we all understand that. So I'm not saying you have to live on the tip of your nose but what I'm saying is that there's a, there's a shorter, maybe not, like we, we kind of advocate a 90 day kind of approach to goal setting and moving forward that allows you to be both reactive, but not just every day making new decisions, but setting a 90 day course 
in that process. So the book is written really for that CEO, that leader, um, because what you can mm-hmm. control on, what you can establish that's consistent is the process, right? Is the process of managing something like this. Now, if you're the only person in your team doing it, um, that's a little bit trickier, but all, like you know, the book even has sample meeting agendas and um, kind of talks about team and how you select team and manage team performance and things like that. So that that is the, the gift of the book, right? Is is saying here's a process you can use because I know the idea of like the constant swirling gives everybody nausea, right? It's like the definition of seasickness, like a moving floor that keeps moving and we never stops. But the reality is like there's a process that can be a kind of you know ice rope, if you will, through change that you can use to just say, okay, well this is what's happening. Let's now ideate, assess, and execute. On what's changed and what's not changed. So when a new pro- platform comes away, great. Or if there's a change in the market, we can adjust. But you're you're not. Yeah, it's not daily. Monthly is kind of the, the the shortest scope I would really advocate for a lot of companies. So you have one meeting in the beginning of the month, and you assess this information. You see what's going, and you chart a course for that month. You're not daily into it. You're not crunching it. I mean, you have team members that are working on it daily. But to have a management profile as you look out 90 days. Um, as a goal for your team, here's our goal. We're going to achieve this money leads, this much revenue, whatever it may be for your goal. And marketing is going to then work on that. But then monthly, you're checking in and assessing and you know relining the ship to where it needs to go in those things. And another another great example of that is um, you know using last year as as that is I want to say maybe around April, April or May of last year. Or so you know, March for us in Maryland D.C. area is kind of when. We went into lockdown and all of that stuff. And by April, ad costs were super low. Um, now, everyone's gut reaction just because of COVID was to pull marketing budgets, which was very kind <laughs> for an agency, right? It's like, we're just pulling marketing. We're going to tighten the hatches and everything. Well, we looked at the data and the market and saw that all the costs of advertising were going way down. But traffic was staying, if not increasing, because everyone's at home. And so we actually took advantage of that and actually increased our spending during that. The only way we would have saw that, not being you know, by any means you know, prophetic, but simply following the process of looking at the data and what's happening. And we just simply saw outside of all the chaos around us, costs going down and traffic going up. That's value, right? If you're paying for less for something more, you would invest in that. So we made that decision, invest in it, we probably landed a few clients through that time in you know that second third quarter of, of last year. So it it follows that same process. You're able to make decisions on a long basis, ninety days, about as far as you'd go, um, and have that joy. Most companies honestly set quarterly goals, right? They probably follow uh, attractions or gazelles or, or some kind of business process allows them to think in ninety day plan. So that actually aligns very logically with a lot of companies that are kind of growing and scaling into systems that. 90 days as a company, they're making decisions. Why not 90 days from a marketing perspective to follow that up as well? And then having your kind of monthly touch bases. So Tobin, you know, a lot of our clients will have at least one dedicated person to marketing or um, sales. What do you think, you know, given what you've been talking about so far, what do you think is their best use of time? The marketing person? Actually, really, I'm, I'm more thinking, that's a great question. I'm more thinking about the use of the salesperson's time, but, you know, yeah. it's, it's both. Yeah, so part of, part of that is talking a little bit out of pocket because, again, I don't know this organization's goals. Like, we, my, this process is very predicated on understanding of yourself as a company, right? So, if you're a marketing person, um, you know, I'll talk about the, the leader and the marketing person. I mean, if they're implementing a process like Ride Tornado or, Ride, or RTX, um, that person is going to be in the weeds, but they're going to have that goal focus of where we're trying to go in the next 90 days with metrics, with, you know, smart goals, if you will, that we're going to be trying to accomplish. And they're working to iterate and execute and try new things and work through it. So they've got the freedom to experiment because from a management perspective, you're guiding them with North Star, right? You're facing, here's a goal we're trying to accomplish. Like you do what you do best, which is market and do these different things. Here's what we try to go. And you're checking in weekly just on the stats through your scorecard of, of how they're progressing. So the the answer to that is kind of dependent on you know, what they're what they're testing, what they're working on. But the marketing person should be really 
in our mind, doing those things, or if they're working with an agency, obviously they will be maybe some management agency management perspective too. But if it's a like a a worker bee kind of you know role in the company doing the marketing stuff, then it all be predicated on what what ideas and, and execution elements they're going to be doing in that time. Hey Tobin, would you have a perspective for um, on the percentage of the overall budget that should be devoted in a typical small business to marketing at this point? Uh, well, it depends on how small the small business part of it is. I, I say 20% should be developed towards business development, which would include marketing um, in that. So 20% is my base number. I actually wrote a blog post about it on, on New North a while ago. Um, that's, that's the high level answer. So that obviously includes salaries and, and things like that. Um, but that's what I would see is healthy. Now, some businesses have nuances here and there, but um, that's probably a pretty steady number, 18, 20% for B2B. And then based on your experience, how many small business owners do you think can actually or will actually um, take your framework of assess, ideate, and execute and do it themselves how realistic is that uh, based on your experience? I mean, I don't know how realistic it is based on our experience because of what Walter was saying earlier. It's just an area that that owners, a lot of owners don't feel real comfortable with. They don't feel real confident about. But but the other piece of it is they end up spending a whole lot of money and they don't they they they, they lack confidence that they're getting a return on investment. Yeah. Um, so there's kind of that oh, should I just do it myself? And they maybe they, they try it, but then they don't have confidence in that. <laughs> so mm -hmm. I probably ask like two or three questions in there. But yeah, maybe. that's good. Yeah, no, so, I, so I wrote the book completely with the hopes of making it like a DIY conversation. Because I've had so many small business conversations. I mean, not everyone's queued up to spend six figures a year with an agency, right? It's, it's um you know, there's a lot of businesses that can need to or can do a lot of DIY internal based marketing. They prefer to hire and things like that. So you, you hit on the core point that I was going to make as you started the conversation is you're doing it like you're doing marketing. The question is, do you really know the value you're getting from it? Are you really are the, are the processes in place to feel confident? Because most of the most of the confidence, I think, if I had to kind of put a guess out there is they don't know what is happening with the money they're spending. There's a lack of feedback. There's a lack of that cycle. The assessment stage is really missing. And there's a level of context that too, like someone may come to you and say, hey, you got 800 people to your website this month. You may not know whether that's good or bad, right? So there is a level of, what does that even mean? Like it's a, it's a number, is that good, is that bad? And, and you, you may need some, some help with that. But I think everyone's doing marketing, they're doing it. The framework is is pretty simple to put together because it's ultimately scalable. It's pretty simple. So I would I would advocate that they would give it a shot because what it'll do is it'll put the pieces in place that allow them to scale, to orchestrate, to communicate with other people on the team. Um, what I find actually is it actually fits a lot of entrepreneurs, you know, kind of view of things because they're the ones who like to try new things. They're the ones who are trying to be out there and trying new things. Well, it drives, and it, at May, cases drive the rest of the team crazy because they're out there like, hey, let's do this today. And the, the marketing assistant's like, oh my goodness, like a new thing. Here we are, it's Monday. You know, We're gonna do, do something different. So it helps bridle the energy of, of ideation and thinking of new things. And like, hey, I saw these cool you know, new pens. We should order some of these. Like it helps bring all that context to that to some kind of system that allows it to be communicated and tracked through the system. So it brings a little bit of logic, a little bit of efficiency to likely what's already happening in an organization, right? It's naturally happening. So it allows the freedom of ideation and opening up to new ideas, but allows for some kind of measurement and consistency. So you can look back and say, okay, we spent $6,000 last year on email and email marketing. What did it get us? And, and that's the informed decision that allows you to say, okay, let's reinvest in that. Let's look at that. I mean, it's that that process has to exist even before someone like we to get involved. Because my first question in a conversation with a leader is like, what's your cost per lead? Right. If you don't know that as a basis, you've got some homework to do. Right. You really should know that as a as a business owner. I mean, we know our cost per lead 
everyone should know their cost per lead or their cost per whatever they're going to measure is critical to their business, cost of acquisition, and other metrics. So all these things are, are needed and it depends on where you are in that growth, in that evolutionary process, whether marketing has been essential or whether it's not, um, even from a sales person perspective, like how's their prospecting, you know, part of it kind of work out. But I think it, I think it would be beneficial, not just because I'm, I'm the author, but I think just as, as a, being a consultant in general, a system in place, even if you implement, it's a, it is fairly simple. I mean, it may sound complicated here on audio, but as you read the book, you see it's a pretty simple process. It brings logic and understanding to what you're likely already doing. So it just again, puts, puts guide rails on it, allows it to slide a little bit smoother. Yeah, and there might be an opportunity too. You know, um, one of the key value drivers of building a business that's going to be sellable or transferable is building out a, a management team and <clears throat> And maybe um, buying a ride to Tornado for that person on your management team or candidate for your management team that has a marketing bent, maybe some training, maybe some experience, and having them start to lead and be the champion of, of assessing, ideating, and uh, executing could be a, a wise strategy as, place, as well. Uh, yeah, I I just make a, make a comment to that too, real quick is, you know, I don't, I don't know all the nuances in terms of, you know, the exit thing, but I, I would say that, you know, what every CEO wants, which is hard, is predictable sales, right? If you follow that to the end, it means there's some level of predictable understanding of marketing too, right? Your sales guys can go out and do these things, but eventually your marketing has to pay off. So I think if you're trying to create systems um, I can only imagine that coming to the table in a, an exit or an acquisition system to say, look, here's our scorecard or you know, our, our data set from our marketing efforts. We see calculable return month over month on these activities. We have a predictable level of traffic, which leads to a predictable level of, of people filling out our contact form and reaching out to us that then go to the sales team. I can only imagine that that's going to be a value driver in the conversation versus the opposite, which would be, well, we hope people fill out our form each month. That, that, that wouldn't be something I would be thinking would be advantageous in a, in a you know, conversation on selling. Yeah, it's definitely right. So Tobin, let me ask you one question as we kind of, as we wrap up. I mean, is digital marketing and or digital media, online marketing, are they really proving to be the panacea we have thought they would be when it comes to this whole area? Well, as I said earlier on, I'm biased, right? So you're going to get a bit of a biased answer for it. Um, if I were to start any business right now, and I'm an entrepreneur. New North is actually my fourth business um, out, out of six that I've started. Um, I would go to digital marketing instantly. Um, it's just got the ripest field and the lowest cost of investment in many cases. Now, depending on the nature of the business, um, that there's always that, that caveat. I mean, if I was going to do high level enterprise sales, I'd probably hire a salesperson first and then, then go to digital marketing. But um, it can help with a lot of businesses. It, it is going to be here. Now, what's going to happen, and I don't, you know, don't want to overcomplicate things, but we've been in probably the sweet spot for digital marketing in the past five years. And by that, I mean the technology has advanced faster than any regulation. And in business regulation, we know can really change things. There's going to be I believe regulation coming to the US market that's already been in the UK market where digital marketing will be limited. Um, you know, I, I actually can tell you right now how many times Pat has been on our website, what pages he's looked at, all kinds of data, because I can track him. I think that's going to change. That's going to be limited. So, you know, if Pat comes to my website tomorrow, I'll be able to see that. And if he looks at a certain service, I could email him about that service. Like we can do some amazing stuff with digital marketing. It's pretty, pretty cool. That, that will get choked back because of privacy concerns. You're hearing more and more about cookie lists. The cookies are what drives that. So we are going to hit a little bit of a, a desert season, I think, in the, in the year ahead. But it's, it's just going to spur innovation, it's just going to push on the market to do new and different and better things. But I would agree, yeah, it's, it's definitely everything it's cracked up to be. If you're not really engaged in it, I would advocate that you would try to get engaged in it, even in the littlest sense, because, I mean, at this point, you're a little late to the game um, it, for most businesses. I mean, there's some, there's some markets that are fully saturated. Like uh, we work in a lot of IT, 
a lot of IT areas. Um, and there's a lot of people who are already involved in it. Um, it's, there's, the costs are really high. If you were in a market that wasn't really pushing in that direction, um, maybe like logistics. Logistics have been at a huge boom in the past like six to 12 months online. Logistics companies, shipping companies, track, tracking companies, obviously that's probably, you know, pandemic driven in, in some cases, but lots of new logistics tech and things like that. Um, so finding like a CDL driver, like that ad cost is through the roof right now. Like that market is hitting. So depending on where your market is, like it may be cost prohibitive at this point. It may be very competitive to get in online. Um, but it's always going to be wise to, to get into digital marketing, see where you are, see what you can do with it. And maybe it's not paper, like maybe it's SEO or it's something else, but you've got a market and they're online. And so it's, it's worth getting their attention. Great. Thank you. So, um, Tell us how listeners can get a copy of your book and how they can contact you. Yep, they can go to ridethetornado.com um, and that they can get the different links of wherever the books are bought. Um, you know, whether you prefer, there's actually an ebook as well. And there is actually an audio book as well. It should be out very shortly here um, on Amazon as well and Audible. So if they want to just listen to my voice, uh, read the book to them, they can do that as well. Um, but you get a lot of info and there's contact form there as well. You can find me on LinkedIn reach out there, obviously newnorth.com, which is the agency that I run. You can reach out there if you have any questions. Happy to talk to anyone. Love talking to small businesses, love business and entrepreneurship. So any way we can help um, go through it. And actually you go to the Ride the Tornado website as well. As I mentioned earlier in the conversation, there are templates like agenda templates and downloads and resources. If you're looking to you know, bring that systemized approach to your marketing to help drive your growth and your goals. Fantastic. Thank you very much. This has been uh, this has been really great. I think our listeners have benefited a lot. So we appreciate you taking the time to join us today. Absolutely. Really enjoyed it. And listeners, if you want help in maximizing the value of your business or planning for your eventual exit, you can reach Pat at 301-859-0860. And you can reach me at 301-951-9090. You can also access resources at exitreadiness.com, grfcpa.com, and nslp.com. As always, thanks for listening. And until next time on the Exit Readiness Podcast, this is Walter Dial and Pat Ennis signing off. 